So uh, let's just talk about uh, adaptive radiations and conservation biology. But before we totally get into that, I, I want to just make a few quick notes about the way we think about phylogenetic trees and kind of patterns of macroevolution. Macroevolution, if you remember, is patterns of evolution at the species level or above, which is often contrasted with microevolution, um, which generally has more to do with the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. So kind of more population genetic approaches, which is what we talked about, especially leading up to the first exam. So, so now we're talking about macroevolutionary patterns. We're talking about kind of the shapes of phylogenies and patterns of species diversification. And we're going to do that in the context of horses because they're such an iconic example of the way evolution often works. So here's some pretty horses running through a meadow, frolicking. Horse evolution, just kind of the broad brushstrokes, uh, 55 million years ago, the earliest horses were around. And um, at that point, there was a land bridge that between North America and Europe. So the horses could move freely throughout kind of the Northern Hemisphere continents. Uh, by 24 million years ago, um, horses were still continuing to evolve all around this kind of northern continent arena and, and also into Africa. And then by 2.5 million years ago, uh, the last crossing of modern horses goes from North America to Eurasia. And that was, that was over Alaska into, um, you know, through Siberia, through Beringia. And um, horses actually went extinct in North America around 10,000 years ago. And they, uh, they were reintroduced by Spanish people um, four or 500 years ago. So horses as a clade, sort of the equids, have been evolving throughout the Northern Hemisphere continents and Africa, um, really dating back to almost 55 million years ago. But the sort of modern horse equus equus that we think of today actually originated in North America, migrated to Eurasia, but then went extinct in North America around 10,000 years ago. So thinking about some of this stuff again, um, let's see if I can squish this over so you all can see. The earliest horses that we know looked pretty horseish didn't actually have a single hoof on each uh, leg. They had um, sort of three main walking toes and then uh, a fourth toe that was still visible. And these were still kind of uh, planted on, they would still kind of walk around on their toes, so they still had hooves. But they had very different, you know, overall body shapes and definitely really different skulls, definitely really different feet than modern horses do. So that's Hyracotherium. 30 million years ago, there was a horse called Mesohippus that um, was also eating leaves. It had somewhat larger teeth with broader chewing surfaces. And by 15 million years ago, there were, there were much more uh, horsey looking horses with um, taller, firmly anchored teeth that were eating more grasses. And then um, by 4 million years ago, the genus Equus had arisen and uh, at, at this point, horses looked essentially, you know, pretty close to modern, you know, with this uh, classic um, kind of all, of all of the weight of the body supported on just one toe on each leg. And so the way the fossil record works, the, the reason that some of those slides were organized from oldest to youngest from bottom to top is because that's the way rocks are laid out, right? So usually when you go out into the world and you find rocks with fossils, 
the oldest rocks are at the bottom, the youngest rocks are at the top. So that's why the, the past few slides were organized the way that they were. And so in, in general, if you want to track horse evolution, a lot of what we knew kind of early on, you know, starting in this, this summary is from the 20s, was consistent with this sort of monotonic change in, a, in several of the different morphological features of horses. So the skull seemed to be changing in a fairly directional way the toe structure and the leg structure seem to be changing in a fairly directional way. And the teeth also seem to be changing in a fairly directional way from, from teeth without uh, big crowns to, to teeth with really long crowns, these really long teeth that could withstand a lot of, um, you know, grasses have a lot of silica in them, so they, they wear down your teeth a lot if you try and chew them. And if you spend all day chewing grasses, your teeth will wear down. So uh, modern horses have really wild teeth. Um, and, and this was kind of the, the vision for the way that evolution worked for, you know, in, in, the early, in the early part of the 20th century was that it tended to go in sort of this one direction from, from one form into another. But we want to kind of steer you away from that way of thinking about evolution because uh, in general, the way evolution works is not always just a steady chain of ascent. It's not, evolution isn't a ladder evolution is a series of branching events and it often results in many species that have different morphologies which we'll talk about more as, as we talk about adaptive radiations but you've already seen a lot of adaptive radiation phylogeny so you know that evolution doesn't always just proceed in one direction from one species to another And so this, this early vision of evolution that was a little bit more ladder-like, even, even in uh, G.G. Simpson's work, implies that uh, genera of horses, <laughs> the resolution on this picture isn't quite good enough for you to read some of these, but the genera of horses would evolve into other genera of horses in this kind of like, you know, highway of evolution that would have these these wacky little, you know, fork tongs of species coming up at various places. But this this is a really fanciful way of of drawing a um, a, a diagram of of evolutionary relatedness. Some some of the width of this diagram has to do with uh habitats that were being occupied. Some of it has to do with, um, yeah, uh, sort of morphological diversity within the genus. But this isn't the way we typically represent phylogenetic relatedness these days. As people found more and more fossils, what, what they found was that it seems like there's a number of different horse genera. And again, sorry, you can't quite, <laughs> sorry, I guess the resolution on this didn't turn out the way I was hoping it would. Um, but each, each of these lines represents a fossil horse genus that lived from, you know, this interval to this interval, you know, from the bottom of the line to the top of the line. And the names aren't super duper important. Uh, the little icon indicates what kinds of plants they were eating. So if you see something that looks more broad-leafed like this, then the horses were browsing. If the, if the plant looks more like grass like this, it's actually a pretty subtle difference that doesn't really translate very well. This is grass. This is the broad leaf. But these horses were eating more grasses. These horses were living in the forest and maybe, or savanna and maybe browsing more on uh, broad leaves. 
So, so the picture that's emerged for horse evolution is not so much just like a ladder of progress, one genus uh, evolving into another, but it was uh, more bush-like where there's a lot of different branches at the same time. You know, if you take kind of a cross section of, you know, 12 million years ago or so, you'd see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 different species of equids all living in different parts of the world, doing different things, having different body forms. And it's just kind of a weird coincidence that the living equids happen to be represented um, mostly just by this one genus. So, so our, our vision of the sort of ladder of evolution uh, that, that we had earlier on in the, in the 20th century especially was due in part to inadequate sampling of this phylogeny. So we really only had um, hierarchitherium, we had um, mesohippus, and we had Merychippus, and we might have had one or two other taxa um, around here, but it seemed as if we only had kind of one genus for each time interval, but that's just kind of a incomplete sampling of this phylogeny. So as we've learned more and more about the fossil record, we've, we've learned more and more that horses actually represent, um, especially in the in the Miocene, they represented a really cool adaptive radiation of different forms. So when we're teaching evolution, and, and if you ever end up trying to explain evolution to you know a classroom of, of high schoolers or elementary school students or college students, I think a really important key concept is teaching people that evolution doesn't progress necessarily just in a linear fashion with humans at sort of the apex as the pinnacle of evolution. Evolution is more like um, this kind of tree with a lot of branches. So one, one question that people like to ask within the context of macroevolutionary patterns is why are some clades more species rich than others? So if you look at different groups of organisms, different taxa, sometimes you'll find taxa that seem to only have one extant species like, like equids. Um, and sometimes you'll find taxa that have millions of species. Um, so uh, famously, the winged insects, the pterygota, they have lots and lots of species. Insects that never evolved wings, the apterygota, they don't have that many species. And so why are some clades more species rich than others? It's kind of an interesting question in evolution. And, and one sort of descriptive way of talking about clades with a lot of species that have a lot of different ecological roles is adaptive radiation. So as I said in, in the previous kind of intro video, adaptive radiations usually have a rapid diversification and a rapid diversification in both form and number of species. So diversification is a little bit of a tricky word that gets thrown around sometimes to mean slightly different things. For the purposes of this class, I mostly mean diversification uh, to mean uh, an increase in the number of species in a clade over time. So diversification happens because of speciation. But in an adaptive radiation, 
you expect both an increase in the number of species in a clade over time that's pretty rapid, but also an increase in the number of sort of morphotypes and, you know, an increase in sort of the overall morphospace or occupied by the clade or an increase in the number of niches that are being occupied by the members of the clade through time. So if you imagine sort of like a x-axis of body form, for example, for multicellular organisms, you might expect that some clades would exhibit more diversity in body form after they've accumulated more species. And so if this happens pretty rapidly, we just we call that an adaptive radiation. So what's an adaptive radiation? We're going to talk a little bit about kind of the broad geological sense of um, adaptive radiations, which you could apply to horses, you could apply it to mammals after the KPG extinction, you could apply that to animals during the Cambrian explosion. Um, some examples of adaptive radiation from more recent times are really rapid. So this, this adaptive radiation in some of the African rift lakes is, is super duper rapid. And then we're going to focus a fair amount of our attention on adaptive radiations in oceanic islands. If you want to see a cool video on uh, on lava in Hawaii, you can you can find that link. So a classic example of an adaptive radiation is the Hawaiian Silver Sword Alliance. Now, as as I as I just said, adaptive radiations usually include a rise in the rate of appearance of new species, so, so an increase in diversification rate in a clade, and also an increase in sort of the ecological diversity that's represented by the clade. So an increase in body forms, an increase in niches that are occupied. Um, and when you think about what could trigger this sort of increase, you might imagine that you would need opportunity. So uh, some adaptive radiations happen because um, the clade in question is suddenly without strong competitors or predators, for example. So after mass extinctions, you often see adaptive radiations in the surviving taxa. So that so the KPG mass extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs, that's when you see a big adaptive radiation of uh, mammals. You see a big adaptive radiation also of um, birds. Adaptive radiations can also uh, happen as a result of an innovation. So the the advent of the evolution of flying in birds was part of a trigger of an adaptive radiation even before the KPG boundary. Uh, the, the evolution of wings in insects was also the, the precursor for an adaptive radiation, just as it was for pterosaurs and bats. So, so powered flight is a classic example of an innovation that can allow for an adaptive radiation after that key innovation has evolved. Opportunity not only happens after mass extinction events, but it can also happen in geographic contexts following dispersal and colonization. So there are some opportunities that arise in time as a result of mass extinctions, but there are other opportunities that arise as a result of the creation of new habitat and uh, subsequent colonization events. So uh, if an island arises from you know, the middle of the ocean and has no life on it, the first organisms to colonize that island might undergo adaptive radiation because there's a lot of kind of open niche space. And just to quickly review, what's a niche? For, for our, it's complicated. There's, there's books written on what a niche is. 
But for our purposes, let's let's just imagine that it's just a way of talking about how an organism makes its living. And it, it involves, you know, part of a way to define a niche is the range of conditions that the organisms can live at. And so you can imagine different axes of conditions that you could use to classify an organism's niche. So for example, an organism might have a particular range of pH tolerances and temperature tolerances, for example. And so one organism might inhabit a particular combination of pH and temperature ranges and another organism might inhabit another combination of pH and temperature ranges. So if, if an organism, uh, if a, or if a population of organisms, if a, if a propagule successfully colonizes a new island that has a variety of different environments available, then that might translate into that population or that organism eventually evolving to, um, to exploit different niches within the, the novel habitat. So for adaptive radiations, ecological opportunity is important. And basically we, we've talked about different types of ecological opportunity. We've, we've talked about ecological opportunity that results as a result of you know, a particular moment in time, a mass extinction, ecological opportunity as a result of a new geographic area that's habitable, and ecological opportunity that follows the evolution of a key innovation. So just like I was talking about before, mammals are classically understood to have undergone an adaptive radiation following the demise of the non-avian dinosaurs. If you look at a time calibrated phylogeny of the diversification of mammal clades, uh, 60, call it 66, 65 million years ago, there was a big extinction event. And a lot of the major groups of mammals seem to have diverged pretty close to that mass extinction event. This is actually not the most recent phylogeny of this, but the, the overall story of mammals diversifying shortly after, you know, 65 million years ago still holds true. It's some of these lines have been pushed around a little bit. Um, and so one way of viewing that is with these sort of like, <laughs> It's kind of a spindle phylogeny. It looks very cartoonish, but basically the x-axis is supposed to represent the diversity of these clades. And so here in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic, these two major groups of non-avian dinosaurs had a lot of diversity because they're very wide in their x-axis and mammals, birds, crocodiles weren't so wide. But then after yeah, at the KT boundary or the KPG boundary around 65 million years ago, these clades of dinosaurs went extinct and then mammals dramatically increased in diversity to occupy some of the, the unused niche space that was left behind after the dinosaurs went extinct. And the, the birds, the avians also diversified to some extent. Crocodiles aren't that much more diverse than they were during the age of the dinosaurs, interestingly. So that's, that's more or less what was happening with horses, uh, except this is after, you know, fast forwarding maybe 40 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. In the Miocene around uh, 25 to 20 million years ago, there was this kind of drying event that opened up a lot of grasslands throughout the world, especially the Northern Hemisphere. And so before you only had a few lineages of horses coexisting with each other or, or at least present in different parts of the globe. And then after grasslands expanded dramatically, the diversity of horses expanded dramatically as well. So in this case, climate change brought with it an opportunity. These great African rift lakes 
here are home to maybe one of the most dramatic adaptive radiations in the world. It's these cichlid fishes. There's a lot of species. This, I, this might actually be an aquarium. I don't actually know where this picture is taken. But the really cool thing about this adaptive radiation of fishes is that um, in some cases, for, for some of the lakes, it happens super duper quickly. In Lake Victoria, there's 500 species of fishes. Lake Malawi has 1,000. Lake Tanganyika has 200. It's, it's really wild just how many species there are in, in all of these islands. Lake Victoria was dry 12,000 years ago. So we know that a lot of these speciation events have happened just super duper recently. In the Great Lakes between the United States and Canada, there's probably, there's around 235 species of fish combined. And uh, a lot of those fish aren't endemic to the Great Lakes, I think. So it's, it's really a, a pretty remarkable level of diversity. However, recently, uh, some invasive species have been introduced to this system, including the Nile perch from elsewhere in Africa, which can grow to be like seven feet long and weigh 450 pounds, and they just eat everything. And so the, the introduction of the Nile perch has been really detrimental to the conservation biology of, of some of these spectacular fish lineages. This is just kind of a quick diagram on adaptive radiation in islands. There's, there's different ways of classifying islands and this, this doesn't necessarily totally do justice to it. Um, but, but first of all, if we can sort of differentiate between mainland, so continental areas that you know have mostly been connected to you know, big land masses versus islands. Islands can form from a few different processes. So there are some islands that, because of plate tectonics, have actually broken off of continents and started drifting around in the ocean. Those islands are sometimes referred to as continental islands. This, this is sometimes the same thing as islands that are just created because the sea level rises, for example, and disconnects things that used to just be like hills from the mainland. So continental islands are islands that have been connected to the mainland, but uh, oceanic islands or de novo oceanic islands are islands that just kind of arise from the bottom of the ocean as a result of volcanism. And those are some of the most exciting ones for studying adaptive radiation because those are the ones that tend to have the most ecological opportunity for new colonists because they're harder to colonize. So in oceanic island systems, the new colonists are free from competition. So that means there's a lot of empty niches all over the place. So we're going to look at a couple of sort of emblematic adaptive radiations in different oceanic islands. Maybe one of the most famous ones is obviously in the Galapagos, which are off the coast of Ecuador over here, very close to the equator. Hawaii, which is one of the most isolated land masses on earth. It's, it's a really cool archipelago, kind of in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here. And then a couple of mammal groups in the Philippines over here. So I don't know if you guys have seen the Pacific Ocean, but it's like pretty big. I'm actually going to switch over to Google Earth mode. Yeah, can you see this? This is all the Pacific Ocean. It's kind of wild. So Hawaii has always been pretty far away from the continents. It's, it's a de novo oceanic island group. And you'll notice that there's this little chain of islands that uh, in some cases it's little sandbars that are just above the surface of the sea. There are little atolls. 
And in other cases, they're just seamounts. So they've eroded so far. But they actually, this system extends all the way up to sort of the tip of the Aleutian Islands in Kamchatka over here. And so the cool thing about this island arc system is that it's actually the result of the same hotspot that's been in the same place on the Earth, but the Pacific Plate has moved over it. So the Pacific Plate has been moving slowly. So imagine if the hotspot was here originally, it was actually up here. The, the Pacific Plate has just gone like that over the course of tens of millions of years. And we now know that about five million years ago, the hotspot was about here. And since then it's moved all the way over here and kind of here. So now, now the hotspot is, what's this? That's not right. That's definitely not the Rio Grande. What? <laughs> Um, so, so currently there, there is active volcanism around here. So there's, there's lava happening, um, in some of these places. Yeah, that's not exactly where that image was, but it's close enough. Um, these, these areas are, are dark and they appear to be unvegetated because they've, uh, the rocks are so new that there hasn't been time for a lot of vegetation to grow over them. Yeah, here's some lava. That's pretty cool. So the big island is, is much, much younger than Kauai. We'll come back to this concept again in the context of the island progression rule. So there's only a couple of ways that you can get to Hawaii if you're a terrestrial organism. You can fly um, or you could hitch a ride on an, an organism that flies or you could get carried by the wind or you could get carried by the water. Hawaii is, is up here in this, in, in this figure. And, and on this map, you can see a lot of the other islands in the Pacific a lot more clearly. So uh, for some types of organisms, they have been able to use other islands as kind of stepping stones to get to Hawaii. So especially birds that could actually direct their own dispersal. It's possible for some of them to sort of fly around in this area throughout the course of their lives. And there are birds that famously fly really long distances. There are others that will just accidentally get blown off course by a storm, end up somewhere for several generations, their population will increase. And then, you know, after a few thousand years, they'll get blown off course by another storm and end up somewhere else. So this has probably happened repeatedly for many of the fauna and flora uh, and, you know, and other types of organisms in Hawaii. In the Galapagos, we have this really characteristic, charismatic group of finches that's often referred to as Darwin's finches because Darwin uh, was really struck by how similar these birds were in some respects to each other. They seemed like they were really similar, um, but they obviously were doing different things in their ecosystems because they have all these different bill morphologies. And Darwin was really struck by sort of how similar but different these birds were. And it's likely that he was kind of inspired uh, domesticated finch breeds that he was really familiar with from England. So uh, he, Darwin knew really well that just in a really short amount of time, people have been able to selectively breed for a bunch of different super duper weird pigeons. <laughs> like, what is that? I mean, it's, 
you know, it's amazing, right? Come on. It's, it's so goofy. Uh, but, but these pigeons, Darwin knew, like, you know, humans in history, the, the breeders that were responsible for these pigeons had bred these wildly distinct birds in a relatively short period of time. And so Darwin seeing what we now know is an adaptive radiation on the Galapagos of these birds that looked pretty similar to each other, but had really different bills and differed from each other in a few features, uh, was one of sort of the Kickstarters that got him thinking about the capacity for natural selection to potentially act in a way that we already knew artificial selection could. So Darwin's finches, you have to talk about them for at least a second when you're talking about adaptive radiations. Something that is less frequently talked about are some really cool rodent radiations in, uh, in the Philippines. So the Philippines, for those of you who don't know, uh, Google Earth. The Philippines is way over here. And you might be thinking, well, that's actually pretty close to Southeast Asia. So here's, you know, this is the Philippines. This is Palawan. This is Luzon, Mindanao. And then these, these islands are sometimes referred to as the Visayas. This is Mindoro. I went to a wedding there last year. Uh, this is Taiwan, which is not part of the Philippines. This is Borneo, which is not part of the Philippines. Sulawesi, Papua New Guinea. This is Palau, where I do a lot of my field work. Uh, the Philippines is a lot closer to Southeast Asia, and Palawan might actually be, uh, well, it's really complicated. Palawan is a continental island that, might, that in some parts of it might have broken off from southern China millions of years ago and drifted down here. And then... Uh, at various points throughout the past few million years, it may have been connected to Borneo, and Borneo may have been connected to mainland Southeast Asia because all this sort of light blue stuff is relatively shallow. But most of the islands of the Philippines have never been connected to a continent. And so, uh, and the, these islands arose as a result of volcanism from the ocean that is associated with kind of the edge of um, a few continental plates subducting, one subducting over the other. So, or one subducting under the other. Um, so, so all the, many of the organisms that have colonized the islands of the Philippines besides Palawan have had to arrive there because of chance dispersal. So the Philippines has a really, really high endemism rate, especially for organisms that can't fly. So with birds, the endemism rate is a little bit lower, but with uh, rodents, it's it's 95% endemism. And some of the cool groups include the worm rats and the cloud rats. And the cloud rats are a group of rodents that have many different forms. Some of them are super fluffy and they kind of look like squirrels. Some of them look a little bit more like rats. Uh, the worm rats, uh, I guess the cloud rats, they're, they're more likely to be arboreal. The worm rats are more likely to be, uh, to live on the ground. Arboreal means living in the trees. The worm rats are specialized on a variety of different worms. And there's, there's a bunch of species. Many of them actually do similar things to each other. So you, you could argue about the extent to which this is an adaptive radiation, but uh, there's definitely components of adaptive diversification in, in this group. So the remainder of the examples we're gonna talk about are mostly within the context of the Hawaiian Islands. And the Hawaiian Islands, again, I've, I've already kind of teased this a little bit, but it's a, archipelago that includes islands that vary in age. Uh, most of the islands that have the so-called high islands, which include land that's more than a few meters above sea level, vary in age from about 5 million years 
to about 400,000 years old. So the Big Island or Hawaii is uh, less than 500,000 years old. And there's still active volcanism in uh, Kilauea Iki and in some of the other parts of the, the east. Here's some lava. Oh, also worth noting, um, or I don't think this is, yeah. Worth noting for, for those, oh yeah, here it is. For those of you who are like hikers or whatever, if, you, if you've hiked a lot of the high peaks in the Adirondacks or elsewhere or in New England or whatever, the Big Island uh, has two mountains that are both more than 12,000 feet tall. So Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa are both more than 12,000 feet tall. So it snows on the top of them, even though uh, the Big Island is about 19 degrees north of the equator, 20 degrees north of the equator. So it's pretty cool because the Big Island is about the size of Connecticut, but it has every biome. So it has cold up top and then tropical down by the ocean. And the prevailing winds are usually from the east so all the moisture that's coming off of that's coming from the winds that have just been blowing across the pacific ocean for thousands of miles all of those all of that moisture condenses as it hits this land and starts to go up and so it's often raining on this side of the island and it's often dry on this side of the island so on this little island the size of connecticut there's every combination of hot cold, dry, wet. So it's really cool. So the farmer's market there is really cool because like they can grow every vegetable. It's kind of an awesome spot. So you have a variety of different types of habitat in Big Island. You have these really new lava flows that are just beginning to be colonized by some plants. And then you have some really lush forests. This is uh, Ohia lehua tree, and this is uh, a tree fern. I think the genus might be Sibodium. And you have these wacky looking little puppies that almost look like they're trying to be some kind of agave or yucca or something, but they're called silver swords. And they are related to tarweed, which is a North American group of plants. But the silver swords are this really cool adaptive radiation of plants that in a relatively short period of time have evolved a really big variety of body forms. So if you can compare the diversity of silver swords, uh, so let's, let's say look at the maximum height of adults. That's, you know, so log transform meters, maximum height of adults, they range from, you know, less than a meter high from, you know, about 10 centimeters high almost, which is 10 centimeters is about the length of my middle finger to, uh, to a few meters high. And uh, this diversity of morphotypes has evolved really recently. So in, in less than, you know, in, in around 5.2 million years, this huge diversity of morphotypes has evolved in this uh, organismal group, which is, uh, you know, even greater than the diversity of morphotypes that you find in like maple, for example, which is a much older genus. So the Acer genus is like 45 million years old. And there's arguably less morphological diversity in that genus than there is in these silver swords. So here's some cool cloud, yeah, just like kind of alpine cloud silver swords, different, different little guys, more, more, oh, look at these goats. That's an adorable human, but, and arguably an adorable goat. But one of the tricky things about being part of an adaptive radiation in a remote 
archipelago is that there's a good chance you evolved in the absence of a lot of herbivores. So Hawaii, Google Earth, if we go back to Hawaii, the organisms that ended up in this archipelago because they got there by themselves without the aid of humans are not totally random. So they really just include organisms that are good at either hitching a ride somehow or flying or they're they have really good you know seeds that are dispersed by wind really effectively so there are no native mammals there besides a bat and a seal there's no native reptiles or amphibians besides the occasional sea snake that uh, swims over there's actually no eusocial insects of any kind. So there's no, um, no eusocial bees, no ants, no termites that are native to Hawaii. So there's a lot of things that are absent there that result in ecological opportunity for adaptive radiations for the organisms that did arrive. But it means when humans start accidentally or on purpose introducing invasive species to really isolated islands some of these invasive species really wreak havoc on the endemics and in the case of the hawaiian silver swords they have no mechanism for protecting themselves against herbivory by uh, mammals so goats are just really really uh, a huge problem for uh, Hawaiian co conservation in general. So there's there's a variety of, of ways that you can try to sort of uh, you know do conservation biology in Hawaii. Some of it involves uh, protecting areas with fences. Some of it involves just trying to do tissue culture so that you have at least some living examples of the the plants that you're trying to conserve. There's a lot of cool opportunities to do um, pretty awesome botany. I've actually, <laughs> this is this is someone who's who's worked in Palau as well. Um, Rebecca put together this this slideshow. The the normal professor for evolution put together this slideshow, but I also know this guy. It's a small world. Um, a lot of the lowland rainforest in all of the islands of the Pacific really have been extensively modified by humans because the lowlands are the easiest to farm in. A lot of times in the remote Pacific islands, the interior is uh, often high elevation and really, really steep. So some of the species that are specialized on higher elevations or on steep terrain have been able to persist throughout the Anthropocene, but uh, in many cases, the, the forests that are closer to the ocean and that are relatively flat have been really, really extensively modified. Yeah, so in, in the case of this remaining native forest, the, the present range of Acatinella tree snails, which are these really cool snails, uh, they're, they're restricted to um, just these really high areas on Oahu that are just impossible to farm in. So these, these are the places that you can still find. I can't believe she doesn't have an Akatanella picture. Super cute, right? So they used to be really, really diverse in Hawaii um, but they've, they've been decimated by, uh, in many cases, rat predation. Let's talk about the honey creepers a little bit. So we, we talked about them a little bit earlier in, in the context of your textbook. They're just a classic example of an adaptive radiation. Just like Darwin's finches, the birds have a relatively recent common ancestor, and in this case, it's you know the the last the most recent common ancestor for the Hawaiian honeycreepers is 
is also just like the silver swords it's around uh you know 5.2 million years ago probably and they have an even wilder diversity of uh bill shapes and sizes as you can see so if you if you compare oh yeah that's gonna get depressing really quickly let's <laughs> if you compare the galapagos to hawaii you can even tell from space that you know hawaii it's it's actually i mean in terms of high islands it's not that many more islands but it's a lot more land area and in the galapagos just the highest elevations um the galapagos has some elevation so it, it gets up around you know more than i don't know if it gets to i don't think it gets to two thousand meters uh, but it, it gets higher than the Adirondacks. You know, it gets it gets higher than 5,000 feet. Uh, but it's still not quite the level of climatic variation that you see in Hawaii. So there's, so for example, in the Galapagos, there's no truly, you know, wet cloud forest, uh, and, you know, and there's not really a wet lowland rainforest. It's, it's much more mesic or dry than most of Hawaii. Whereas Hawaii has, has both desert and uh, really, really wet rainforest. Kauai has, you know, like 8 million centimeters of rain per year or something. It's super duper rainy in Kauai. So uh, there's, there's a big range of habitats. The islands themselves are bigger. They're spread out over a slightly larger geographic area. And so in general, many of the clades that are, or many of the, yeah, many of the clades that are present in both Hawaii and the Galapagos, the things are a little bit more diverse in Hawaii. But because Hawaii is so much more isolated than the Galapagos, you don't have things like tortoises um, and you don't have, you don't have marine iguanas. So uh, Hawaii does also miss out on kind of colonization events. Sorry, I'm just like zooming in and out. So the Hawaiian honeycreepers, very, very cool birds, really cool adaptive radiation, but right now a very sad story. And, and some of that goes back to the first Polynesians that arrived in Hawaii, the first Hawaiians. Uh, they saw these birds and they were like, oh, that would look very beautiful on my body. And so there are these amazing, amazing capes made of bird feathers that are incredible and would have taken a very long time because they had to catch these little birds, you know, that are between the size of a chickadee and a blue jay um, to make these feather capes. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's estimated that some of these capes would have taken 80,000 birds, which is just, I mean, amazing. It's an amazing work of art. It's an amazing artistic achievement, but it's also, um, yeah, incredibly sad from a sort of bird conservation perspective. Uh, so the the Hawaiian the native Hawaiians were already um, exerting pretty considerable uh, harvesting pressure on these on these birds by the time the first Europeans had arrived. Laysan and Finch, I don't know if you all remember that one from a little bit earlier in class when we were talking about um, conservation population genetics and how the, the FST was um, the, uh, the effective population size was really low in, um, in some of the Laysan and Finch populations in the Northwest Islands. But yeah, there's, there's a variety of bird bill types that um, have evolved and, and some of the nectar feeders are kind of the coolest ones because their bills are just doing really, really wacky things. And this is 
just kind of a molecular phylogeny showing that there are many uh, really closely related taxa within this uh, Hawaiian honeycreeper uh, group. These are these are some outgroups. So the rose finch ancestor of the Hawaiian honeycreeper is probably arrived in the archipelago, yeah, potentially sometime between 7.2 and 5.8 million years ago. Uh, and so people have attempted to sort of date this the last common ancestor of the of the current extant Hawaiian honey creepers. And in general, it seems to correlate with some of the ages of the islands. So this is this is a time calibrated phylogeny with the age and millions of years of the islands. And it's nice because it actually the oldest island does happen to be in the west and the youngest islands in the east so you can kind of line them up like this in this really neat way it actually kind of works with the the x-axis of this phylogeny now in general when we talk about the island progression pattern which which we'll we'll circle back to a little bit we think about taxa uh, originating in the oldest island and then colonizing the younger islands subsequently as each island becomes emergent above the ocean. But overall, this pattern is more, you don't really see a very strong signal of this pattern in these uh, honey creepers because some of them are found on every island, like the EEV or the Apapane or the Akepa is found almost everywhere. There's this series of Amakihi that exist on different islands. And, and this, the Kauai, Oahu, Maui, Hawaii, these Amakihi are kind of, you know, exhibiting a pattern that's consistent with the island progression rule, but uh, it's not super strong. So in this, in this figure, uh, we're just showing different birds from Hawaii and uh, the ones that have gone extinct are circled in red. Yeah, so, so a variety of factors have contributed to the extinction of birds in Hawaii. I, I alluded to invasive species earlier. Rats have probably played a huge role in the extinction of many birds because, again, these, these birds were evolving for millions of years in the absence of mammalian competitors or predators. So uh, they, they're not really behaviorally equipped to deal with rats that are trying to like raid their nests, for example. Mongooses were also introduced um, maybe 100 or 200 years ago or so. There's, there's some snakes that have been reported from Hawaii, but I, I actually don't know what this one is. And then for the, the land snails, there are a variety of potential predators as well, uh, including some of these really very beautiful flatworms, but uh, they're not from Hawaii. And then there's uh, the rosy wolf snail, which is a voracious snail that eats other snails. So the first Hawaiians, the, the Polynesians that originally colonized Hawaii, uh, they, they probably brought Pacific rats with them. These may have been the kinds of boats that they were sailing in. And uh, if, if you've seen Moana, you'll know that uh, Moana had some animal friends that went along with her. I think she has a chicken, right? Um, Polynesians probably did bring a few different kinds of animals with them when they went to the different islands. They probably brought rats. 
they probably brought pigs and they probably brought chickens. Europeans also definitely brought rats. So in the late 1700s, when Europeans were starting to make contact with Hawaii, uh, the Norway rat arrived and then uh, Rattus ratus, the black rat arrived as well. And Rattus ratus is, is typically one of the most problematic ones for uh, conservation. That's, that's often kind of the, the worst one. House mouse, probably not as huge of a deal. I don't know. Uh, and then, and then there's also uh, definitely non-native birds that have arrived, like the red-crested cardinal. Um, these non-native birds potentially brought bird diseases, so that there's now in the islands you can find birds with avian pox. And then there are also non-native mosquitoes in the islands that transmit vector-borne diseases to the birds, like avian malaria. These feral pigs. Uh, pigs were brought over by both Polynesians and Europeans. Feral pigs today, uh, they really, they mess things up a lot. You know, they do that. But they also, it's, it's hard to describe if you haven't hung out in a forest that's dominated by tree ferns, but tree ferns are really delicate and their trunks are kind of hollow a little bit, at least when they start to decay a bit. And so when pigs are kind of messing around a lot, what they end up doing is, you know, they might knock down some tree ferns, but they also step on them and create little areas where water can collect in the tree fern. So there tend to be a lot more mosquito breeding habitats where there's pigs around. Yeah, so here's kind of a timeline for some major events in uh, Hawaiian history. The first Polynesians may have come to Hawaii before, yeah, you know, in, in the early centuries of, um, the, the first millennium. And then uh, more voyages of Polynesians arrived at Hawaii, uh, you know, between, yeah, between 1100 and 16, 1650 seems very specific. Uh, but it's, it's noteworthy. I, maybe this is a good time to to mention that Polynesians are people who share kind of a language group. So just like people who speak um, Italian and Spanish are kind of united by a lot of like shared words and some shared culture. Uh, Polynesians have a lot of shared words and, and their languages are really similar. And the Polynesian triangle is typically uh, defined as being from New Zealand. So Maori people are Polynesian to Hawaii to Easter Island, which is like over here. Yeah. You guys know Easter Island, right? These little, these little guys. So the people who built these structures are Polynesians. And Polynesians by about 1200 had made it to here and here, wherever Easter Island was, you can't even see it. And all the islands in the middle and Samoa is, is typically, that's definitely Polynesia as well. These islands are culturally different. Fiji is usually considered part of Melanesia, Fiji, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, those are Melanesia. And then Micronesia is from uh, Kiribati to Palau, and then some of these Northern, Northern Marianas Islands and some of these other Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia. So the Micronesia is, let's orient this. Micronesia is, is pretty much the islands that are north of New Guinea, and they tend to be really small. And then Melanesia is, is mostly, sometimes it includes New Guinea and then these cultures right here out to Fiji, and then Polynesia 
starts around here and then go includes New Zealand. New Zealand was one of the last major uh, land areas to be inhabited by people. And their language, the Maori language, has a lot of words in common and, you know, has some features in common with Hawaiian. So Polynesian voyagers were really, um, you know, in this time period, I, I just bring it up because in, in this time period from 1100 to 1650, they were really some of the best voyagers. They, they were really good navigators and they probably repeatedly arrived at Hawaii on purpose which is really incredible. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of things have happened to Hawaii. And in in general once once Hawaii became increasingly colonized uh, first by first by England and then by the United States uh, a lot of um, there's a lot of agricultural pressure on the lowlands so the the original Hawaiians were modifying the forests in the lowland tropical rainforest as well but uh, that obviously really accelerated in you know in the 1800s and the 1900s a lot of sugar was grown in Hawaii this is sugar cane there's cattle ranching that's being done. Um, this is this is maybe this is like the saddle road on the Big Island. Actually, this this might be Mauna Loa. And then there's definitely urbanization. So the the island of Oahu is where Honolulu is, and there's like a million people on this island. So the other islands are, are less developed, but Oahu definitely has a, an urbanization problem as well. Oops. The brown tree snake is its own whole story. The brown tree snake is, a, is mainly a problem in Guam right now. Guam is part of Micronesia, so it's pretty far from Hawaii. But it's, uh, there's a big US military presence in Guam. Guam is a territory of the United States, just like Puerto Rico is. And uh, there's a really big military presence. And so uh, there's this brown tree snake that ha is really invasive in Guam. And it's really decimated a lot of the the birds in in guam and there are a lot of flights from guam to hawaii so people are always on the lookout for a brown tree snake even though yeah guam to hawaii is like an eight hour flight Pe people people forget how big the pacific is but it's it's a it's a long flight but there's there's a fair amount of traffic so Anne marie gowell who uh, is a cool dude. We'll maybe we'll check in with her later in the class. Uh, she's done a lot of work in the conservation biology of Guam, and and here she is, just like a total bamf, handling like <laughs> a seven foot brown tree snake. Um, Hawaii is a great place to work if you want to just like cry yourself to sleep all the time, because there's a lot of extinction happening there all the time. So the po'olui is a great example of a bird that uh, had a very small population in a habitat that was highly endangered and changing really rapidly. And people tried their hardest. They, they tried to fence out pigs. Um, but the population was still decreasing. And it, by 1997, which is um, still probably before a lot of you were born, um, there were only three individual birds known.
and in November 2004, a captive, the, the one known bird that was in captivity, died of avian malaria. So there could still be two birds alive in the wild, um, but they were last seen in, in 2004. And so this, this gets into some tricky stuff where, yeah, it, it's just hard to know what to save in, in conservation biology sometimes. And the way some of the decision making has gone in Hawaii, people have attempted to save the organisms that are in the most dire need of conservation, uh, you know, of, of some sort of intervention. So it's kind of worst first conservation where you, you try to help the, the organisms that you, you try to help the species that are in the worst shape because they're the ones that are in the worst shape. Right. Um, but it's people are uh, questioning this, the sort of logic behind this, because if something is a lost cause, it might unfortunately as sad as that is it might not make sense to spend a lot of resources on it it might make more sense to uh, divert your resources towards organisms with more uh, potential for um, success yeah so you want to ideally um, try to figure out a way to compromise between you know helping the species that really 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 need it or else they'll die but maybe they're just going to die anyway even if you help them as much as you can versus helping with the conservation of species that don't need it as much but might be kind of near threatened or something like that so it's it's a bit of an it's a bit of an ethical but also a, a practical problem that conservation biologists are faced with in a place like hawaii where there's a lot of extinctions So I think I'm going to leave it, I think I'm going to leave it here um, with this. So conservation biology is difficult in remote oceanic archipelagos in part because of uh, invasive species, in part because they're often small to begin with. And, you know, the islands themselves are small to begin with, with respect to continents. So organisms often have smaller population sizes anyway, because they're on these small islands and their habitats, their geographic distributions might be really, really narrow. Um, and the reason that adaptive radiations may have flourished here in the first place is because there were so few competitors and predators. There was so much empty niche space, but because there were so few predators or competitors when the adaptive radiation was taking place, many of these members of the adaptive radiation are, we could, we could say that they're evolutionarily naive. They've, they've never encountered predators or competitors before. So when invasive species are introduced that prey on or compete with them, then it's often a, a serious threat to the survival of that species. Yay. Okay, bye.